Today I'm going to cover two different areas, each having three points. History, as requested by the boss, and an additional three points, I, I, I believe we should understand if and when we talk about the Criollo cattle project on the Hornada. Suffice it to say, I can only scratch the historical surface surrounding the Criollo due to its 500 plus year path to February of 2015. Some parts of this road map are missing while other parts are quite sketchy and you can see some of this on figures three and four of the handout. Now for three points I would like to leave you with regarding history surrounding the Criollo cattle. Point one, the Hornada's Criollo cattle genetics can be traced back to the Andalusia region of southern Spain. This is a 333,000 square mile area made up of eight geographic areas, each named for the chief cities the province contains. It's from the western coast of Andalusia that Christopher Columbus set sail from Caldez in 1493 and it is on this second voyage that he brought cattle to what we now refer to as the Western Hemisphere. You can see about the location of that uh, port with that yellow dot on figure one. Point two, the cradle of the cattle industry of the Americas began in the cow pens of 10th century Castile. The ox and cow were originally kept to draw a plow or cart. And it is from these animals that range animals raised for flesh and hides evolved. By the time Columbus embarked on his voyage of discovery, the cattle industry of southern Andalusia had undergone two and a half centuries of organized improvement and stabilization. However, no record has been discovered as to the exact kind of cattle the Andalusian stockmen ran, except that they were Taurine heritage, that is of the boss Taurus bloodline. However, recent genetic studies using microsatellite markers suggest that the Chinapas Criollo cattle currently found in southern Mexico show a strong Zebu influence, confirming the impact of Bos Indicus together with the genetic signatures of the Spanish Iberian cattle and what that had on the Criollo genetics. However, the presumed ancestral sources of these cattle remain largely unexplored at this point. My last point concerning history suggests that only between somewhere less than a thousand if you read Rausch, or possibly as few as 300 if you read Olson, of the original head of cattle brought to this uh, western hemisphere have resulted in the animals that we have today. You can look at figure two and this will sort of help you there. The exact number of cattle shipped from Caldez if I'm pronouncing that correct, you'll, correctly, if ever recorded has never been found. The Spaniards were the first to move large animals on ocean voyages from the Atlantic ports on the Iberian Peninsula to the Canaries was a voyage of 900 miles and that took about four to eight days. Figure three has that uh, map there. While the trip from the Canaries to the Indies was 2,500 miles and took about 60 days. Many details remain unknown about these shippings, including how the cattle were loaded and offloaded from the ship, or how they were confined once on board the ship. Some detail is provided concerning the shipment of horses, so one may assume similar approaches were used with the cattle. Heifers and young bulls were normally transplanted overseas since their smaller size would have simplified shipping problems to some extent. Even on a bare maintenance diet, the animals moved on ships would have required a quantity of feed and water three times their own weight for a 60-day voyage. 
The first cattle to enter New Mexico took place in 1598. That was 105 years after that second voyage of Columbus. The expo expedition of Juan de Ornate, Ornate is credited with bringing between 4,000 to 7,000 head of cattle into what is now New Mexico. However, I'll tell you about an hour ago, I read something that the number was 799 cows. So I think there still may be some questions there. However, the point of origin of these cattle is in dispute, since both Hispaniola and Cuba have been named by different writers. And on figure four of your handout, I have provided a reference for the figures that I use. So I would suggest that any of you interested in more of the history, check out Rausch's book from the NMSU library. Now to change gears a little bit, and there are three points I believe are important when we talk about the Horonadas Criollo cattle. My first point is really a chastisement for each one of us. When we talk about Horonada Criollo cattle, we should never refer to them as a breed. The word criollo or creo has been used since early colonial times in Latin America in reference to both people and animals as being those individuals now in the new world from parents of Iberian origin. This is not a definition of breed. So hopefully, you are now asking yourself, so how then should I refer to our Criollo cattle? According to Jorge de Alba, a Mexican animal scientist, he told Freddy that it is, an, it is appropriate to refer to the various land races or biotypes of Criollo cattle yet remaining in Mexico together with the region in which they are found. For the Criollo cattle we currently have on the Hornada, the most accurate term would be Ramure Criollo cattle. This is a great segue into putting a plug in for what Chris has already put a plug in for us, and that is that the galley proofs of a paper entitled Criollo Cattle Heritage Genetics for Aired Landscapes is being set up as I'm talking here. This plug for our paper allows me to defer a more detailed explanation now in the hopes that you will be enticed to read this paper when it comes out later this year in Rangelands. This manuscript was, repa was prepared by several colleagues and myself to hopefully bring some accuracy to what is currently being said and written about this biotype or land race of cattle. My second point on <clears throat> what I'd like to have you go away with is you should already be asking yourselves why then are we doing research on Remore Criollo cattle? The importance of preserving genetic diversity in animal and plant populations for future generations is essential, especially when breeds or biotypes, land races, are in a critical or endangered status. Due to factors I do not have time to discuss today, our Remuray Criollo cattle fall into this endangered category, mainly through what might be termed genetic dilution. And you can see that on figure two of your handout. For, the, <coughs> for a uh, visual effect of what genetic dilution might be. Once the Criollo cattle were crossed with European cattle, the remaining pure genetics of the Criollo have been reduced and those that remain are at risk. Therefore, the Horonada's current cattle research focus is not on a crossing program of Remurial cattle, but rather on preserving this gene pool and determining what heritable traits these cattle may possess that will assist us to better manage arid rangelands on which foraging is just one of many multifaceted demands. Now for my final point. 
I hope you're asking what are we trying to answer with the criollo cattle? What is a desirable trait criollo, remora criollo cattle may possess? There may be many, but I will use one which I have a deeply held bias for, and that is animal distribution. The current nutritional behavior literature concerning criollo cattle is sparse at best. Part of what has been published can be classified as fact, while other parts currently fall into the category I would call, we hope it is fact. It is the goal of all future Hornada Ramore Criollo research to reduce the current, we hope it is fact, category through scientific investigations, working with colleagues in the Animal and Range Science Department and the Department of Agricultural Economics here at NMSU. And I'm just going to diverge from my text here for a minute. Talking with Freddie a few minutes ago, it sounds like we may be incorporating some folks from uh, the University of Chihuahua in Mexico. One exciting researchable question strongly suggests that Ramore Criollo cows may carry desirable designer animal genes that give them the propensity to distribute themselves over the landscape during foraging in a manner superior to how some of our current commercial breeds or their crosses distribute themselves. If this is true, the management of free-ranging cattle could be substantially improved assuming we as managers first place the proper number of animals on the landscape, that is get our stocking rate correct first. 